Welcome to our, our conference on the way of the pilgrim, um, or the way, the way of perfection, according to St. Teresa of Avila. I'm not sure that everybody that's um, here or is listening um, has a copy, but you'll find that just by talking about the book, you'll get a very good introduction to the theology and, and the teaching of Teresa. So if you haven't been able to get a book, or um, you'll find that the talks will uh, introduce you to her. That's the important thing. Sometimes people say, well, she was a Carmelite nun. What's she doing? Um, what, what can she say to us um, who are just living a, an ordinary everyday life? And I think it's important to realise that, um, that there's only one Christian holiness, and that's our relationship with Jesus. Now, whether you're a Carmelite nun, a priest, various lay um, ways of living, there's only one holiness, and that's our relationship with Jesus. So what she's writing about here is that basic relationship with Jesus. Now she's doing it, as we'll see, for her particular sisters, but nevertheless, the message is just as applicable to us as it was to the people of her time. Before we actually get into the subject, I'd just like to talk a bit about Teresa herself. We're talking about somebody that lived in the 16th century, a very rich century in terms of the church. It was the time of the Reformation, but also the time of some very great saints. Uh, she was born in 1515, grew up in a, a, quite a, a religious family. Um, she wasn't particularly religious herself in her early years, but um, she uh, ran away, as it were, from the fa her father to enter the Carmelite convent when she was 21. And she lived in that convent for many years. Um, and the convent was, was not like convents we know today. It was a, um, a very lax convent. People could come and go as they wanted. There were well over 100 people there. There were not only people that have a religious vocation, but in those days, that noble women that didn't find suitable husbands could, could um, go into the convent. And indeed, people could go into the convent to get a better ed education. So there wasn't a sort of a, a universal culture there that enabled everybody to pray. And Teresa, looking back on that first 20 years of her life there, um, was very critical of the life that she lived. She felt that she didn't um, um, live fully in that time. But when she was about 40, she had a conversion. And from then she began to experience significant things. And it led her to look at a way of trying to reform the life that she had lived at the convent of the Incarnation. Um, that the, the Carmelites had begun on Mount Carmel as, as hermits. Then they came to the West and the men became mendicant friars, and it was there that the women were started, and they lived the rule, uh, the rule of Carmel, but gradually it had come to be made easier. And what Teresa wanted to do was to get back to the earliest period, to the, to the more um, challenging rule that existed then. So when she was about 42, she, she started a convent. She founded a convent. Now you, cannot, you could ask, here she was in this convent, how could she found one over here? Well, the convent was so lax that she could, she could do that. The convent she founded wasn't a Carmelite convent. It was just a convent that she started. Now, it later became a Carmelite con convent, a Carmelite reformed convent. But that was, that was her, her challenge. Now, it was for those people, those young people there, just a small number, I think a dozen, that she wrote the book that we're considering, The Way of Perfection. And she had been writing a draft of her life prior to this, and she finished that draft in these years that she was in St. Joseph, which was the new convent. And uh, some people suggest the way of perfection was a sort of a summary of her life. The autobiography is one of the great pieces of not only Spanish literature, but Christian literature, along with things like the Confessions of St. Augustine. A number of people have read her autobiography and been converted to the faith. So from St. Joseph, um, she got permission to start founding other convents. And eventually she founded one for men, and it was there she met St. John of the Cross, who was really the most famous of the men of his time. And uh, after a time at St. Joseph, she was sent back to where she had been before, to the convent of incarnation, and she was sent back there to be the superior. And there were riots and things. You know, here she was coming back. And of course, when she founded the new convent, there was all sorts of opposition because you know, most of the children of the locals 
would have been in the other convent. So she then went on to found other convents and um, she was still in the process when she died. Um, Therese is a, a wonderful person to know and I think we'll get to know her as we read her writings. Many years ago I was sent to Rome uh, to do some studies and my first day in Rome I, I found, I found um, there was a lot going on at the cathedral at Basilica. So I went down and all these people were there and what they were doing was they were declaring St. Teresa of Avila a doctor of the church. And the doctor of the church is, a, is the highest title that the church can give. And you could say, well, you know, people like St. Augustine, their, their volumes that they wrote were this big. And what did Teresa write about? She wrote about herself, her journey to God. And that journey to God was so insightful that it has become a very, a very dominant influence right down to our present day. So that's just um, an introduction to the person. But let us now begin on the, the work itself. Um, the, I, ha I have a sheet that the people here have. Um, I, I can't get it to the people who are watching outside, but next week I'll have the sheet put on the um, parish website so that if you're watching next week, you'll have this sheet in front of you. You don't need the sheet. If I use the sheet, I'll read from it. So you're not missing anything by not having the sheet. The sheet is largely for homework. You, know, you can read it afterwards and perhaps remember some of the things that are said. And I won't read everything that's on the sheet. But nevertheless, um, it, it is helpful um, to do that. Just a, uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of quotes um, before we start. Again, all the quotes that I'll mention today are from the way of perfection, most of them anyway. So they're just um, giving you the, the, the essence of the book, which is what we claim that we were going to do. She says, before speaking of the interior life, that is of prayer, so what she's talking about here is prayer, I shall speak of certain things which those who attempt to walk along the way of prayer must of necessity practice. So she's going to begin by setting the, the climate, as it were, uh, for the people that are going to exercise the life or live the life of prayer. And she has a, another saying uh, there, she says that you, you may be sure that anyone who sets out the pieces in a game of chess will not be able to play well if he does not know how to make the king, to put the king in check. In other words, it's not just knowing how to set up the pieces, there's a whole strategy of the game. And that's what she is setting out to do. In, in another place, I don't think he says this in the way he says that um, if, if you go to God on contemplation alone, you'll end up a spiritual dwarf. In other words, without the life of the virtues. And that's what he's going to talk about today, the virtuous context in which the life of prayer is to be had. One of the church fathers talks about um, the Christian life in terms of an arch. And he says that the keystone at the top that holds the sides up, that's prayer. But he says the keystone won't stay up there by itself. You've got the sides of the arch, and the sides of the arch, in his language, was rooting out the vices and practicing the virtues. In other words, prayer and the transformation of our life go together. Now, in this first section, uh, chapters 1 to 15, we're looking at today, um, she's going to talk about that context of virtue. And she's going to suggest that there are three things that she considers to be important. She said, there are three things that I will explain at some length. It is essential that we should understand how very important they are to us in helping to preserve that peace, both inward and outward, which the Lord so earnestly recommended to us. She goes on to say, one of these is love for each other. The second, detachment from all created things. The third, true humility, which although I put it last, is the most important of the three and embraces all the rest. So she's going to talk about um, love, love for each other, detachment, and she's going to talk about um, humility. I want to say that those three things are the realities behind the vows of religious life. A religious make a, a vow to poverty, chastity, and obedience. Now, what those vows are simply an expression, a, a, a particular expression 
of the basic virtues that need to be in every Christian life. So what Theresa is talking about here is not just something that's the basis of religious life, she's talking about something that is the basis of Christian life. So with those three things, um, love for each other, detachment and humility, they're the important things. Now we're going to talk about each one of those and just see what she has to say. And I'll try to relate um, that to um, um, the tradition of our church, because Therese is very much a person of the tradition. Um, she certainly has new insights, but one of her major things is she put it all together, right? She sort of laid it out, as it were, and that, that was a great contribution. But of course, in doing that, she made particular contributions as well. So let's talk about the first one there. She talks about detachment. And detachment is what's behind the vow of poverty, right? And detachment means uh, not, not clinging to things. The opposite to detachment is attachment. Now what she has in mind here is not just an attitude to things. She's talking about a way of living in relationship to Jesus. So this is not just something about material things. It's endeavouring, as I've got in the things there, to uh, commit oneself to a way of life centred around total self-giving to God. So the eye of, det of detachment is, is to do um, with attitudes. Uh, and really what she's going to say is that the reason for, uh, that the way detachment unfolds depends on attachment to Jesus. In other words, uh, if we are detach attached to Jesus, if we are committed to Jesus, then we can easily have a different attitude to the things that we have. And material things and material honours and all those sorts of things, they're neutral. It's our attitude to them that can be a problem. And what she's talking about here is that we need to empty our heart from those things in order that we can let the Lord fill our heart. I think we should emphasise that the journey to God is basically a journey of the heart. Now it finds expression in life, but it's a bit like marriage. The, the key to marriage is the commitment of relationships of the two people, and what unfolds is a common life together. And what she's talking about here is a way of committing ourselves to God and um, recognising that that attachment uh, means that we, we have a certain attitude to the things that we have. So we haven't got to go home and sell all the things we have, but we might have to go home and, and change our attitude. Are these things, do they own us or do we own them? And that's the, the, the difficulty um, that we have. So it's, it's important to, um, we're talking about the attitude of things, uh, not things themselves because they are neutral. So she, she says that, that, that um, to live the virtue of poverty, to live the virtue of detachment, we need to give ourselves wholly to the Lord. So it's always the Lord that's there, not, not the material things, if you like. It's the focus on the Lord, and the consequence is the attitude that we have to other things. So it's always that personal relationship that I think it is important um, that we keep in mind. She says that we should live the virtue of poverty. Um, she wanted to get back to a very primitive way of life, and in fact some of the primitive things she wanted to do she wasn't able to do, because people thought that was a bit too primitive. But nevertheless, she, she makes the point that, that if you're poor, um, you've got to show it, right? She says there, you've got to earn your alms. So if you live in a big house, you can't go around and be asking for alms, or if you're wearing the best clothes, going around asking for alms, as it were. So she's saying to her, to her sisters that they've got to live a simple life. And that, that's part of detachment. Because if you are detached from things, you're not chasing things, you're not building up a, a mass of things around you, you're, you're actually simplifying your life as you focus it on the law. Now it may well be that you're a rich person or a poor person, you may be very involved in the world or not involved in the world, but underneath is that life with Jesus. And if that's there, then the way you live in all the situations that you're in can be lived with a focus, a focus that helps you always to have your heart uh, fixed on Jesus. So she says that the virtue of poverty gives freedom in the world. 
In other words, we can take things or leave things. That we're not dominated by the world, we are able to um, exist in the world. And if she talks about it giving us a stability in life, right? That we are able to rest there without being having lots of highs and then lots of downs. If that we have that holiness of of, of union with Jesus, it enables us to to have a stability and to live um, a, a much more um, stable life. She also talks there about money and honour. I've already talked about that, that those are things that can draw us away. Nothing wrong with money or honour, they're neutral. But if we start chasing them, if we make them the goal, if they become our treasure, then that's where our heart will be. What she's talking about here, Jesus is the treasure that we should have, and therefore in our heart, then we should be wanting to be with Jesus. I think we're not defining today um, the final goal, but what does it look like to, to be a mature Catholic person? Well, what it means really is to consciously and intentionally live our life in union with Jesus. That's what it's about, and that's why the personal dimension here, it's not just the question of doing this and this and this or that and that and that. You do those things, but really it's what's behind those things. If you come to Mass on Sunday, um, there's lots of people at, at Mass on Sunday with different motivations. Some people come because other members of their family are coming. Some people come because they're you know, deeply committed to the Eucharist. So there's a whole variety of things that are there. But underneath, what we would hope to develop is that, um, um, that union with Jesus. That is the thing that comes through. She says there that um, um, about money and honour, about um, not clinging to, to our attitude. She says in number eight there, detachment of self. She says, it is here that true humility can enter for the virtue and that of detachment from self, I think, always go together. They're two sisters, humility and detachment from self. So we've talked about detachment from things. What is detachment from self? Well, that's detachment from your own opinions and your own um, goals that you, that you have that may not be in keeping with, the, uh, with what you do. As I was talking about that, um, an incident in the life of St. Therese of Lisieux came to mind. On one occasion, they were in the convent where she was, they were giving out the jobs. And she, she thought about it and she said that if she got the job she wanted, she would only do it half for God and half for herself. But if she got the job she didn't want, then she had to do it all for God. <laughs> and so she was happy to get the job she didn't want because in doing that, uh, she was doing it all for God. Well, that's all I wanted to say about that first um, element of detachment, poverty. And she says on one occasion that really, <coughs> while she has already said that humility is the, is the bigger of the three, she says she can't understand how love and humility can exist without us being detached. Because in a sense, this is detachment is like the wedding ceremony. You know, it's, it's establishment of the relationship. And the love and the humility uh, unfold what that relationship um, is all about. The second thing that she talks about there um, is love for each other. And we might just important think about that for a moment. She, she talks about two loves. Um, the ordinary human love that we find in families and friendship. And she says that that's a good love. Um, you know, that if it's practiced well, that's a good thing. But she says there is another love um, that is a spiritual love. And the spiritual love really doesn't involve liking people. It's, it's a reaching out in love uh, according to the way that we have been loved by God. Um, there's a wonderful um, section in, in a book by Catherine of Siena. She wrote a book called The Dialogues, and it's the dialogue between the, God the Father and Catherine. And God the Father said to Catherine, you can't love me, or you don't love me, the way I love you. I loved you without any commitment at all. I just reached out in love. But when you love me, you love me for all the things I've done for you. The fact that I sent my son and I have brought you to salvation. So in a sense, you don't love me in the way I have loved you. But God the Father said then, when you love your neighbour, then you're loving as I have loved you that the Christian commitment is to reach out 
um, to our neighbour in the way that God reached out to us. So um, the idea of, of love as being the presence of the Father is important. In the writings of um, the Gospel and the letters of John, um, they use words there that are quite different to what you'd find in, in, or, or meanings that you'd find different in the dictionaries. Uh, for example, um, it says that God is light. Jesus could say, I am the light of the world and we are to live in the light and we are to be the light of the world. And what does light mean in that context? Well, really, it's the divine life. God is light. And that divine life is there in Jesus. Uh, I am the light of the world. And we receive and live in the life, that life, and then we share it with others. God is the truthful one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And we are to walk in the truth. In other words, it just doesn't mean don't tell any lies. It's saying that, that this is the way of God. And of course, God is love. As the Father has loved me, I have loved you, says Jesus. So Jesus is the presence of the Father's love. And the command to us is, love one another as I have loved you. So what we're talking about here is, is a spiritual love, a love that is reaching out. And that's why uh, we could see in the Gospels, love your enemies. In other words, we're loving as the Heavenly Father loved. And as the Gospels say, uh, we need to be compassionate, as compassionate as our Heavenly Father is by sending the rain on the good and the bad and the sun on the good and the bad. So we reach out um, in that love. So I think it's important that we, um, we do that. Um, the, 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 letter to the letter to the Philippians comes to mind um, of where um, Jesus is presented as the one who, who gives himself for others, who, who empties himself and and gives himself for others. And she makes the point that if we want to know about love, then we really need to look um, to Jesus. That's, that's where it is. And to look to Jesus is to be looking to the Father. Because Jesus is the human presence of the Trinity. Right? I think the Incarnation is a wonderful example of, of the thought of, if you're going to communicate with someone, how, how do you communicate? And if you can identify with them, then that's the best way. And really the incarnation is the Trinity identifying with our human nature so that we can learn and be drawn uh, into the divine life. So she, she's very good um, on, on talking about the, uh, um, the way we should love. She says that those people who love in this way are much fonder of giving than of receiving. Because I think love is a giving. And I think even in human love, in married love, there's a sense in which if that self-giving stops or dries up, then in a sense the marriage is lost. Now it may go on and people don't get divorced and things, but, but it, it's that living relationship that is the thing. And that's what I think she's talking about here. She says it's helpful to, 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 to relate to people who are on the journey as well. In other words, it helps... Um, to be with others that want to live the faith life um, courageously. And of course that's what religious life was and how it came into being, that groups wanted to come together to actually share their life. And that's what our parish is about. Our parish is meant to be a place where <coughs> people can share the journey to God. I have a little thing that I often remark. There's a, a Greek word in, in the New Testament, koinonia, and it's translated in two ways. We translate it, when I say we, the Catholic Church, as communion. But the Protestant tradition translates it as fellowship. And it captures, both are important, because they capture different things. I think what we're capturing with the word communion is that our community is that community that is in communion with Jesus. I think that's the point that's being made there. But I think that the Protestant translation of that very same word is capturing not only the relationship to Jesus, but the relationship that we have for each other. Uh, Protestants can say they go to church for fellowship. Not, a, not an expression that we might use, but it's capturing the relationships, whereas the other word captures uh, the union with Jesus. It's not a question of one's better than another, it's just that the one word in the Greek 
has both of those implications, that when you put it into English, you have to sort of use two words, um, as it were. She talks about the importance of example, um, that um, not only learning from others, but us giving the example. Uh, within her community, she talks about um, things that you can do um, that help others to live in virtue, to live a virtuous life. Um, I think it's important that we, by our own witness, witness to the other members of our community. I think in the church today, there's a lot of division and some people have sort of drifted away from our community. And I think it's, it's quite a challenge to bear witness to that fundamental thing that brings us together and to live it as well as we can. Pope St. Paul, St. Uh, Paul VI, has a wonderful saying at one stage in one of his letters. He says that the, the axis of evangelization um, is faithfulness to the message and faithfulness to the pe people to whom we preach it. In other words, it's not just a question of having the message correct. That's not enough. Really, it's got to be communicated to people. It wasn't given to us for us. It was given to us for others. So if you're living the Christian life as it were lived 200 years ago, you could say, well, here it is. That's what they used to live. But is it speaking uh, to the world today? And I, I think that's about our life. We just need to live our faith in a positive way. And of course, the first expression of our love for God and response is the duties we have in life, just being the person that we are as we have been called um, by the Lord. So I think she, she's really good um, in saying those things. One of the things that was a big issue for her in, um, in her early years was uh, her reputation. She, she sort of really, her honour was the word that she used in, Span in Spanish, but it, um, she was conscious of the way um, things needed to be um, done in relationship to her. So Teresa's saying there are three things, three virtues that you need to practice uh, to live the life of prayer. And we've looked at detachment or poverty. And the second one was to love each other. And now we're looking at humility. Um, and that's the third. And she says at the beginning that that's perhaps the best or the most important. Um, but certainly she gave a lot of emphasis to detachment as well. So three things. These are the things that are there in the mix. It's not choose one or two or, or leave one out. They've all got to, um, to be there. Um, for her, the real issue is um, to look at Jesus. Um, the, the letter to the Philippians makes the point that um, the, the, the Word, the Son of God, uh, emptied himself and humbled himself to become like us and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So she constantly makes the point there that um, uh, we need to look to Jesus. And she says you should set, we should set our eyes on Christ, our good, from whom we shall learn true humility. And from that she begins to go and talk about self-knowledge. Who are we? Why well, do you see on the news these days people asking who is a woman? And how do you find this or how do you find that? Well, who are we um, in terms of our life? And I think that a response that uh, we would make is that we need to see ourselves in relationship to God. And that's what humility is. It's about a statement about how we relate to God. There are a couple of important um, uh, texts in the New Testament about the, that are about how we relate to God and, and its uh, emphasis on humility. The story of the prodigal son. Right? It's part of three little stories there about the lost coin and the lost sheep, and then there's the lost son. But there's a bit tacked on the end of the lost son. It's not only about the lost son, it's about the found brother, the good brother that stayed at home. And a lot of people think he had a very good case for making the point that he stayed at home and didn't get any reward at all. But the story really is about how do we go to God. It's, it's a story that's being told to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees uh, were very proud of all the things that they did and that would get them to God. For example, in the temple, the Pharisee said, I don't commit adultery, I give a tenth of my good to the poor, uh, I'm not like this publican. But the publican said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he was the one who was the most acceptable. And it's the same with the story of the prodigal. 
the issue of the elder brother, it's not that he shouldn't have stayed home and done all those things, but it had created a situation where he thought he, 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 he was judgmental on his brother and he felt that he, his need needed to be rewarded. And the point being made is that we don't go to God just to pick up our reward. Really, our going to God is acknowledging that salvation is given to us completely by God. So that the two confessions that we have there, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, they're acknowledging who we are in relationship to God. And of course, that's why we start off the Mass with acknowledging our sins. In other words, it's not a question of saying, I've done this and this and this. No, no, we're acknowledging our status, as it were, that in relationship to God, we throw ourselves on the mercy of God. Um, there's another little story in the scriptures in Luke, chapter 17, verse 7. I always remember that, that one. Uh, it's about the servant working in the field. And uh, when the servant comes in, he doesn't, uh, the master doesn't sit him down and get his dinner and look after him. No, he gets the master's dinner, because that's what he's supposed to do. And the Lord then said, um, when you have done all that you should do, do, say, I am an unworthy servant. In other words, we do have lots of things to do to live according to the teaching of Jesus. But it's not a question then of going to get our reward as if we earned it, as it were. No, it's something that um, comes from, from God. So we are, who are we? We are who we are in the eyes of God. I think that's a good way uh, of putting it. She also there talks about um, humility and prayer. She says, for humility is the principal virtue which must be practiced by those who pray. Now, she talks there about, we've already talked about chess, knowing how to, to um, set up the pieces, and that means know the virtues. But she now uses another chess image uh, in which she says that humility is like the queen in the chess game. And the queen is the most important part, most important figure in bringing the king into check. So humility is like the queen um, in the chess game. And that's important. She goes on to say down the bottom there, but humility is, is about, do, about um, um, doing the will of God. If we're humble, we are going to live the will of God. Um, one of the things that a lot of people find difficulty is a reference to the, to the saying, fear of the Lord. Um, it, we can't really get rid of it because it's in the scriptures. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So we've got to ask what exactly does it mean? And it's not just our normal concept of fear, fear, but it, it's a, a, an approach to God and we recognise the greatness of God. But also then, we commit ourselves to live according to what we have seen. We often use the words awe and splendour uh, to, to, to translate that fear, but you can have awe and splendour when you look at a sunset. That doesn't mean you go home and change your life. Whereas fear of the Lord is recognising the role of the Lord um, in, your, in your place. And that means you're going to um, do what the Lord asks you to do. Um, there's a, a wonderful expression from St. Augustine where he says, the one who serves you best is not the one who listens for what he wants to hear, but the one who shapes his life according to what he hears. And I think that's what humility is about. It's accepting um, where we are um, as coming from God. Just let Teresa talk for herself. Reflect that true humility consists to a great extent in being ready for what the Lord desires to do with you and happy that he should do it. Right? But very often we, we find it hard to recognise that God's ways and our ways uh, don't always meet. And I think it's humility that enables us to actually acknowledge the difference and live according to the, to the will of God. Um, she says, true humility consists with our being satisfied with what has been given to us. So I, I think, you know, that, that really um, humility is, is, is causing us to want to do the things that God has called us to do. Um, one of the spiritual writers that an American uh, evangelical bishop is, uh, Phillips Brooks, he has a saying that um, to understand... Um, with humility, you don't have to um, put yourself down and, and, and look as, as low as you can. 
He says, you stand up at your full height and compare yourself with a nature that is far above you. And that sort of situates who you are. I often use the example, if you're the, the Australian tennis champion, you've got reasons to be proud. But if you compare yourself with a Wimbledon champion, then, then maybe you recognise that um, you, you still have a bit to learn. And I think that's what we're talking about with humility. We're actually um, um, recognising that we are always to compare ourselves with the Lord. And we need to be grateful for the things that God has given us because we are so often have many great gifts and uh, we don't want to deny those and pretend we don't have them. We do have them and therefore we need to acknowledge them but I think we need to acknowledge that they come from God. I think the danger is always that of pride. Remember in the garden, what was the temptation of Adam and Eve? Um, if you eat of the tree, you will be like God. Right? You will have independence. You won't have to rely on God. And that's the very rejection um, of what it is. So humility, I think, is very important. Uh, there is an Eastern, Eastern saying, uh, an Oriental Eastern saying, not a Christian Eastern saying, that I think sums up humility well. It is that the mountain lords it over the molehill, but both are dwarfed by the stars. And the point being made is that the distance between the mountain and the molehill is nothing compared to the great distance to the stars. And if you apply that to what we're talking about, you can say the mountain is like the person that thinks they're doing well and they can look down on the people around them. But if you take the stars as the point of reference, really there's no difference between the mountain and the molehill. I can remember more than 60 years ago when I was learning to hear confessions, one of the priests said that the priest that thinks he's doing well will be hard on those that people come to him. But the priest who recognises that he's a sinner will welcome those who come to him as fellow sinners. And I've seen that happen. You know, some priests get into all sorts of strife and public issues and things, but very often they're the people, the priests that people will go to. And I think the point being made there is that if the priest is humble, if the priest is able to say, I am a sinner, then he will recognise that those that come to him uh, um, our fellow sinners. So I think that Teresa's point there is very valid and I think it's, it's fair that we should um, take those three things seriously. Now the next section of this particular book will focus on prayer. As the word she's saying, here's the context, uh, don't jump into prayer straight away as it were, um, but um, start working with the virtues because that's essential. And so we'll, next week we'll take up um, her teaching on prayer. Thank you. What say we take one minute just to have a little chat with yourself and if there are any questions or comments, we'd be happy to take them. Oh yes, we've got a question. Yes. Yes, I, I, I think the, um, the, the, the struggle that um, we find in life, St Paul captures, uh, when he says, the things I want to do are not the things I do. And the things I don't want to do, they're the very things that I do. And I think he's pointing to that struggle that we have um, within our own life. And ego is a sort of a psychological word, but it's pointing to that self-centeredness that's there, I think, in our life. And over the years, we've seen that as the result of our, or, or we've seen it as the disorientation of our human nature through sin, that we were created for God. The default in our creation was God. But through sin, the default has been, has come our own selfish interest. So there's a struggle to actually turn our life towards back to its original default, which is God. So I think that's a, a, you know, a psychological way of saying it. And I think the more we can use a, a bigger framework, the better we can understand it. Yeah. Do we have any other? Yes.
go down, you know, yeah. try to suppress. Yeah. But is that humility? Well, it is. Uh, can I just repeat the question for the camera? Uh, ben, w would the people have heard that? Oh, they would have. Okay. Well, uh, uh, they wouldn't. Okay, then. Um, th the question was raised that when you're talking about something that you love, like music, for example, and you're speaking a lot about it, and suddenly you realise, you know, am I boasting? Should I be talking about those things? I, I think you've just got to make a judgment at a particular time. I, I think the thing I mentioned earlier about Phillips Brooks, that it's not a question of bending down and saying, you know, I don't like music at all, but it's a question of standing up and acknowledging that you like music, and that's, that's important. I remember I was talking to some people one time and one of the ladies said uh, she loved opera. And another lady in the group said, oh, isn't that wonderful? How many records have you got? And she said, oh, I don't have any records. I just, just love opera. And the other lady said, how often do you go? And she said, oh, no, I don't go. But, uh, <laughs> but she loved it. Right? So there's nothing wrong with acknowledging your love. Um, I think it's only when selfishness comes in. I feel one of the major issues we all fight is what other people think of us, right? And there is a tendency at times to, to, to boast without actually knowing we're boasting. So I think the fact that you are aware of it means that you know the limits of, of what, you know, what is appropriate. Yeah. But is that when, when you Well, no, I, I, th I think humility, just taking your example, is acknowledging that you have a love for music and you may have talent for music. Um, so I, I don't think there's any problem in, in saying that and that's giving glory to God in saying it. I think it only enters in when there's a selfish dimension to that that you then become boasting as it were. So I don't think um, it's wrong to talk about the things that we are good at or that we like. Um, I, I think that's fairly normal. Yeah. Do we have any other comments or questions? Yes. Um, the question was, the comment was, um, was she recognised in her life um, or did it only come later? I, I think she was um, recognised to some degree in her life because she founded over 20 convents. And uh, really, um, the, the period in which she lived was a time of reform, uh, not the reform of a reformation, but the Franciscans, for example, in Spain, were going through a process of reformation. So I think she would have been recognised. And so she was a, a lady that wrote to kings and bishops. And, you know, she really led a very public life. Um, and as part of her reform, there was a certain enclosure that sort of wasn't there in the previous place where she lived. So um, she really reached out a lot. So I, I think you'd have to say that she was. Um, well accepted, well I won't say well accepted because there were always people that didn't want these things to happen, but I think a lot of people recognised her contribution during her life and then as it unfolded um, the Carmelites like a lot of new um, um, new congregations had difficulties, I mean we've got Teresa um, Teresa we often associate Teresa and John of the Cross, but there was the real man in Teresa's life was Grazia who became the first um, prov provincial of the men's, the men's side of things. And he didn't do as good a job as God of the Cross might have done. God of the Cross was imprisoned, uh, imprisoned in a religious sense, was locked up in a cupboard for a long period of time. So there was sort of conflict, and the major conflict was within the Carmelite order, because many people felt that the reform was a judgment on the way that they were living. Just as in the church today, you might find a group that's reforming and people sort of think, well, that's, that's a bit excessive, you know, going that far. Does that help? Okay. Do we have any other questions? Yes, I'm sorry, down the front here. Yes. Uh, today, the Carmelites are seen apart from an enclosed door. Yes. Yes. What stage? Teresa. Teresa is the one that really introduced the, uh, the enclosure. And they still live, I think I was a chaplain to an, to an enclosed order at one stage. And um, they're, they're very busy people. They don't go out, but they, 
they have lots of people come to them and, and their prayer life and things like that. But she would have been the one that enforced that. Unfortunately, I think that's falling away to some extent because not only the Carmelites, but the Benedictines and the Benedictine orders um, um, had enclosure too. But you can often meet them these days in public places. It's not nearly as, um, uh, as strict as it might have been in the past. And some people think that's good. And some people think it's not so good. Yes. Were you right after a question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yes. Oh yes. Now the enclosure is still, it, it, the enclosure is stricter among the Carmelites than the Franciscans or the Benedictines who also practice enclosure. There was a, a I knew one of the uh, the nuns at Lismore. Um, when my first parish, I went to Campsie, and the first uh, I was there for a little while, and I decided to go over and talk to the kindergarten. And um, I asked her to what, what they hadn't done, and she said, they haven't done Lazarus raising Jesus from the dead. So I went over and I, I drew a tomb on the board and Jesus and Lazarus coming out of the tomb, and I spoke about Martha um, um, and Mary. And um, um, the next day, one of the mothers came up to me and said, um, I believe you're over at the school. My little one came home and I said, what did Father teach you? And she said, he taught us how to draw tombs. <laughs> And the next day they always talk about Arthur and Martha, Arthur and Mary. But anyway, I was leading up, I decided not to do that to kindergarten anymore, and I went to first class where the sister from Carmel, in the Carmelite was, and I went in there and I filled the board with my learning, and I all sat there stunned, and as I walked out, sister said, they don't read running writing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have to get used to those things. I'm sorry, there was a question there. Yes? Well, I, I think that's true. But I, I think, think what we, we, we try to do is to try to be, to live consciously in the presence of God. Um, sort of being mature in the faith doesn't mean we stop doing what we do and step aside and just be alone with the Lord. I, I think we need to do what the early monks did. They prayed while they did the other things. That you, whatever you're doing, um, or most things that you're doing, it, it isn't hard to turn your heart to God. I remember on one occasion I was saying things like this and there was a man sitting in the front seat and he had huge hands, I noticed it. And afterwards I talked, was talking to him and he said, I always think of God except when I'm using the saw. He was a lumber man. <laughs> so when he was using the big saw, he, he, didn't, he focused on the saw. But I, I think that, that what we need to try to do is to be in the presence of the Lord. And the early monks used to just have a text of scripture, oh God, come to my assistance, the Lord make haste to help me that they would repeat while they were doing things. And the important thing was to develop the heart. And if your heart's developed, whatever you're doing is a prayer. Whatever you're doing is an expression of your relationship with Jesus. So, so you, you develop, what you're developing, I think, is you're, you're trying to make the thing that you're doing part of your relationship with God. And it doesn't mean you have to do it differently externally but it's a question of in your heart, trying in the process of doing it, to turn your heart to God. Does that make sense? Good, okay. Yes? You can. Um, I, I think we need to look uh, at the situation in terms of the revelation of God. God has spoken um, in creation, in the Jewish tradition, and then in Jesus. So really what is creation? It's God's first revelation of the divine self. So that um, to be caught up in creation is to recognize that, and we should. Um, these days we talk a lot, a lot about the ecosystems and we've become more conscious, but um, our, our creed is, I believe in God, the Father, the Creator. It runs early in the, in the creed, and I, I think it's important to, to recognise it. So really, um, it's, it's a very essential element of our faith, 
It's the first revelation of God, which was filled out in the revelation that followed in Israel and in Jesus. Does that make sense? Good, okay. Okay then, well, is there anything else? I think no, no other hands. So thank you all for coming, and we'll be back next week. And I will try to put the sheet on the, um, uh, on the parish um, website for next, next time. And um, you could, you're welcome to print it off and use it. The purpose of the sheet is that you might be able to share what we've done with others. Okay? So thank you very much, and thank you to our listeners. Yes.